Good morning. It's uh, great to have all of you here at the presentation on the World Bank's India and South Asia updates. Uh, first of all, may I request all of everyone here to switch off their mobile phones. Thank you. <clears throat> the Indian economy uh, has done well under extremely difficult circumstances that included a pandemic unlike ever seen before. A war that has played havoc with commodities, trade, and energy prices, and a sequence of extreme weather events that have uh, with increasing frequency and causing more and more damage. Yet there is much that could go wrong in the days ahead, and the bank's research will help both India and the larger South Asia region better negotiate the days ahead. I'm especially glad that we are having this conversation at CSEP, whose research spans macroeconomics, energy, climate finance, sustainability, health, trade, competitiveness, amongst other areas. Our foreign policy team has been working closely with researchers across South Asia on a multitude of issues facing India and South Asia. Uh, the Center for Social and Economic uh, Progress facilitates in-depth policy relevant research and conversations around it. Our objective is to enable evidence-based recommendations to the challenges facing India and the world. We draw on expertise of our researchers and research network experience of industry stakeholders and civil society, and extensive interactions with policymakers to inform our work. I'm glad that we have an excellent panel today to present and discuss the findings from the World Bank. <clears throat> A.K. Bhattacharya, at present, is the editorial director at Business Standard, a leading business newspaper of the country. He's based in New Delhi. He has been an economic journalist for the last four decades. Uh, he has served as the editor of Business Standard earlier. He was the editor also of The Pioneer and has worked at the Financial Express and Economic Times. He's a distinguished fellow at the Ananta Aspen Center, a think tank with global affiliation and a member of the Economic Affairs Council of the Confederation of Indian Industry. Uh, it's a much longer introduction and, uh, and <laughs> we have a long panel and, uh, and, and each of the panelists have long introductions. So with your permission, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'm uh, welcome, uh, AKB, as you're fondly known, uh, to be here. And I'm uh, really glad that you could take the time out to, to chat today's proceedings. Uh, Francesca Onsorge is the World Bank Chief Economist for South Asia. In this role, she's responsible for leading the research program on key economic issues in South Asia to inform the policy debate and the World Bank lending. Before starting this position, she was the manager of the Development Economics Vice Presidency, where she spearheaded the flagship Global Economic Prospects Report. Prior to joining the bank, uh, Francesca Onsorge worked in the office of the Chief International uh, Chief Economist of the European Bar for Reconstruction, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and at the International Monetary Fund. Her research has been featured in peer-reviewed journals as well as policy publications and has covered a range of topics in international macroeconomics, finance, debt and financial crisis, inflation and so on. Uh, her work has been widely cited, including in The Economist, The Wall Street Journal and The Financial Times. She holds a PhD from the University of Toronto. Welcome. Uh, Dhruv Sharma is a senior uh, country economist with macroeconomics, trade and investment practice of the World Bank. He is the lead author of the India Development Update and will present the key findings today. His work covers macroeconomic policy analysis and modeling. His work also includes providing analytical support to the Ministry of Finance and Finance Departments at the state level. Previously, Dhruv worked in the World Bank's Indonesia office as well as with the Australian Treasury. Dhruv received his bachelor's in economics and PhD from the University of Sydney. August Tano Kwame took over as the World Bank's country director for India on August uh, 2022. A national, a national of Kote Duwabar, he most recently served as the World Bank's country director for the Republic of Turkey. Prior to this, he served as the director in the World Bank Group's independent evaluation group. He also held positions as practice manager in the macroeconomics and fiscal management practice of the bank. He has held positions of sector manager for economic policy, uh, as the chief economist for MENA region, he has also served as assistant to the World Bank Group president. Uh, he holds a graduate degree in applied economics from NSEI Paris and a PhD in economics from EHESS Paris. He has attended a program in economic management at Harvard University. Welcome. Our panelists include Dr. Renu Kohli and Amrita Goldar. 
Uh, Amrita has over 15 years of experience working on energy, environment, and climate change projects for the government and non-government uh, uh, agents. Many of her projects are with central government ministries and agencies that shape India's negotiation standpoint at international forum. Her ongoing projects include understanding battery waste management linkages to sustainable EV supply chains, design, designing a critical mineral policy for India, studying the impact of renewable energy and efficiency policies. She has uh, uh, been awarded a PhD degree in economics from the Center for Economic Studies and Planning at JNU. Her doctoral thesis focused on bilateral investment agreements and their impact on India-bound FDI. Welcome, Amrita. And last but not the least, our very own Dr. Renu Kohli. She's an economist with res and a research practitioner with experience on macroeconomic policies and issues. Uh, she has previously worked with the RBI, the IMF, and think tanks, including ICREA and the IEG. Her work has focused on financial sector liberalization, capital flows, and exchange rate management in emerging markets. She has been published in refereed journals, such as the Review of Development Economics, Journal of Development Studies, Journal of Asian Economics, Oxford University Press, IMF Working Papers, RBI Staff Papers, and so on. Uh, Dr. Kohli has a wider engagement with the private financial sector and investors through talks, presentation, and consultations with on Indian macroeconomic policies. She has also served as an independent director on the boards of NCML and NFIN. Thank you, Renu. So uh, welcome. May I now request uh, AKB to lead? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, very good morning to everybody here. Uh, uh, let us start the proceedings uh, without much ado. Uh, we have two excellent reports uh, to discuss uh, and uh, uh, two excellent uh, discussants uh, who will uh, sort of uh, um, decipher it for us. Uh, so let me start the proceedings with uh, um, on Sorge and we have 30 minutes, 15 minutes for you and 15 minutes for uh, Thank you. Uh, the presentation, should I just click up? Very good. The first page. <laughs> Do you have the opening page? Oh, actually, I need to go back, right? There we go. <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and to be joined by this distinguished panel. And you, thank you very much for making the time and joining us. So this region is doing better than the rest of the world. These are difficult times for the global economy. I go through... So I, I structure my remarks around four questions. First, what's the outlook for South Asia? Second, how can South Asia's fiscal risks be addressed? And I'll show you that the, this region has larger than other regions fiscal challenges. Third, what might the energy transition bring? What might it need to, 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 to kindle, accelerate the energy transition? And what might be the implications for labor markets? So let me start with the, the outlook for the region. As you can see here on the left, the, chart, the, the region is doing better than other regions in the world. So the golden diamonds show you growth in South Asia for the next three years, 22, uh, 23, 24, and 25 as well. If you extended that chart, it would look the same. And the blue bars show you the growth rates in all the other regions. This region is doing better than all the other regions. But there's always a catch, right? <laughs> but this is still a slowdown. It's a slowdown compared to pre-pandemic averages. And that's what you see in the chart on the right for all the countries in the region, what the World Bank calls South Asia. You see in the blue bars, the growth rates that we expect over 24 and 25. And you see in the golden lines what growth used to be, the pre-pandemic average. And you can see that in, for every single country, what the next few years will bring is slower growth than what we got used to before the pandemic hit. And it's not just slower growth than what we got used to before the pandemic hit, it's also slower than what is required to meet the authorities' own goals. 
Most countries in the region have a goal of achieving high income status within a generation. And for none of these countries is, it the, is the current growth rate sufficient to achieve this goal. The gap differs by country, but for none of them is the current growth rate sufficient. What is holding up growth in the region at the moment is strong is, uh, structural factors and cyclical factors. So strong potential growth, strong uh, fundamentals will always play in the, for the next few years, will play in the region's favor. So there's rapid working age population growth, compared, especially compared to other regions. There's also a lot of potential for catch up, for productivity catch up, simply because per capita incomes are still very low. They're about 120th for the region as a whole, 120th of the, the level of advanced economies and one fifth of the average emerging market and developing economy. So that, that can be a driver for growth. There are also currently cyclical factors that play in the region's favor because the region is so closed, and we'll get back to that, because the region is so closed, it's not affected by the slowdown that's happening in the rest of the world as much as other emerging market and developing country regions. And also, currently, there is a bit of a rebound effect from these severe recessions in some of the crisis-struck countries. So this, the, the, this year, next year, growth is still lifted by a little bit by these structural factors. And then trend growth will take over again. These are the baseline growth forecast. That's if nothing goes wrong. And there are many things that can go wrong. What happened here? Yeah, so there, there are several things that can go wrong. There's a, a slowdown in China that could happen. There are natural disasters. Let me go here. And then there are fiscal challenges. So let me start with a slowdown in China. We have done a scenario where we assume that the, the real estate troubles in China will become much more virulent. And you will have a slowdown in China to just around 2%. So that is very low growth. That's kind of on par with the pandemic. That is very, very low growth. But this, remember, it's coming from a low base. Currently, the World Bank is projecting China's growth at some, somewhere around 4.5%. So a further slowdown. If the, the real estate the sector, the weaknesses in the real estate sector in China could trigger a further slowdown. And here the chart on the left shows you what that would mean, what the spillovers would be to other emerging markets and developing economies, including South Asia. You can see simply because the region is fairly close, the impact on South Asia would be about half of that of other emerging markets and developing economies. So the, the average emerging market in the developing economy would fall by about a percentage point if you exclude China. South Asia would slow by about half a percentage point. It really is quite insulated. So that's one risk. Another risk is, of course, a perennial risk of natural disasters. This region is particularly exposed to natural disasters. Just to illustrate that, we have the chart on the right. 60 million people per year, on average, have been affected in some form or other by natural disasters in this region. Yeah, so the, the, the 60 million people is an average per year. These things, unfortunately, don't come reliably every year, so you can plan for them. They come with massive impacts one year, and then there is a couple of years nothing happening, and then there is another big disaster that affects millions of people. So it's very difficult for policymakers to plan for these things, but this is a serious risk for any policymaking in the region, and more than in other regions as you can see here. Now, the third risk is our risks arising from weak fiscal positions. And there the region really stands out. This is what this chart shows you here. On average, government debt is 86% of GDP. That's higher than in any other developing country region. You can see here the, the red bars on the left, they show you the 86% of GDP average debt in the region. And for EMDEs, it's somewhere about seven, around 75% of GDP. So it's much higher debt. Not only is it much higher, it's grown much faster since 2010, which is what we've called the fourth wave of debt, the, the 2010 to current. And one of the reasons for this high debt buildup is simply the revenue weakness. It's quite extraordinary how weak revenues are around the region. It's not just GDP. It's around the region that revenues are below the average. And Bhutan is an export they were going to be. So word spreads very quickly. You can see in the chart on the left that in every country other than India, there are more pollution intensive than green jobs. So the golden bars are the share of pollution intensive jobs. 
and the blue bars are the share of green jobs. In every country other than India, there are more pollution-intensive workers than green workers. And even in India, 9% of workers are in pollution-intensive jobs. As the energy transition really gets going, some of these will have to look for new jobs. So it's up to governments to make that happen. And these workers are different from others. I mean, they have specific characteristics that may not make it so easy for them to move into different jobs. And that's what the chart on the right shows you. The probability that a secondary, that a worker with secondary education or tertiary education has a pollution intensive job is, well, the pollution, a worker in a pollution intensive job is less likely to have a secondary or tertiary degree. A worker in a pollution intensive job is more likely to have an informal job. So these, it's, it's exactly the most vulnerable workers who may be looking for new jobs. It's really up to governments to create jobs, just generally improve job creation so these people can find new income earning opportunities. And also to help these people move. Help these people move geographically and help these people move across sectors that just facilitate movement in general with with things like matching, better matching mechanisms, digital platforms, infrastructure. Government is investing very heavily in infrastructure. That helps people move. It's portable social benefits. I know there are programs here done by the Labour Ministry to try and make benefits portable. These are exactly the kinds of things that these workers will need to be able to move into new, new jobs as the energy transition gets underway. So lots more detail in each of these chapters, and I invite you to look at the, the website as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for making this presentation and staying more or less in time. Uh, um, uh, I think uh, the outlines is very clear, and now we move to Dr. Sharma. For the uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for having me today. Look forward to a good discussion afterwards. Let me get started with um, um, the India Development Update. Uh, this is a biannual uh, report that. Uh, the team here uh, based in the country produces. It provides our assessment of uh, um, uh, recent developments as well as our outlook for uh, India's economy. So just let me start with a, a quick uh, um, uh, discussion of the key messages in our report. Um, <clears throat> Starting with the global context, uh, um, you've got that from uh, Francesca's uh, presentation as well. Uh, you know, global um, conditions are challenging. They were challenging last year as well, and some of those challenges remain, um, uh, including elevated uh, uh, price pressures, um, uh, a monetary policy, um, uh, the monetary policy tightening cycle that we saw last year, rates and cost of borrowing still remain high in many parts of the world at the moment. Um, and despite these uh, external um, challenges, uh, India's economy grew uh, strongly last year. It was one of the fastest growing economies. Uh, and uh, our expectation is that uh, India will continue to remain one of the fastest growing countries this fiscal year as well. Um, we, do have a, uh, we, we do have a moderation in our forecasts relative to last year. Um, but as I said, if you place this in context with uh, other major economies and also in the broader context of a, glowing, uh, sorry, a, a, a global growth trajectory that is set to slow, India is doing uh, quite well. I'll come, to some of the re uh, for, I'll come to some of the reasons we have our, uh, you know, that underpin our forecast in a moment. Um, but uh, two uh, areas that I'll point out right now is uh, strength in the services sector, um, as well as um, infra investment. Infrastructure investment is a key policy focus of the government, and uh, we'll spend a moment on that in a few mi minutes as well. In India, food price pressures are keeping um, headline uh, inflation elevated. Um, that, of course, has implications for uh, consumption, growth, and, and, and uh, monetary policy as well. Um, our expectation is that uh, the current account deficit uh, will narrow. 
Um, and, uh, 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 you know, our, uh, another uh, key message from our report is that um, the government's commitment to fiscal consolidation will remain. We've seen over the past couple of years, uh, the government is quite committed to uh, reducing the fiscal deficit. And uh, our expectation is that will co uh, continue, notwithstanding uh, the fact that we have uh, um, elections in the country next year as well. Um, when we think about fiscal policy, uh, uh, you know, when we think about uh, what's going on with India's public uh, debt to GDP ratio, our expectation is following what happened during um, uh, the pandemic when public uh, debt to GDP ratio rose quite sharply, uh, just uh, below 90%. We're expecting it to stabilize around 82%. Uh, percent uh, over the next few years. Um, from a sustainability perspective, um, uh, we're not concerned, but there are some things that uh, um, that I'd like to point out in a, in a few moments uh, uh, worth noting when it comes to thinking about debt to GDP. So let me um, go straight to uh, a quick um, a summary of uh, uh, the most recent data that was released. Uh, this data was uh, data covering the first quarter of this particular fiscal year. And um, what we saw was underlying um, uh, strength in the economy. Uh, you know, GDP uh, uh, grew 7.8%, and that was largely as a result of robust domestic demand. Um, consumption, which makes up about 60% of India's economy, and investment, which uh, makes up another 30%, uh, both of these uh, components of GDP performed quite well. Um, on the, uh, you, you can think about GDP from an expenditure perspective and also from a production perspective. And I mentioned services a moment ago. Services grew quite strongly, uh, growing uh, uh, above the, uh, their uh, long-term average uh, trend growth over the last few years. And we're expecting that um, strength in services to continue. Um, there's a story when it comes to services on the export side as well, um, and and uh, how India's uh, export of services has has changed over the last decade. What did the underlying uh, strength in the economy? What did that translate to in terms of labor market outcomes? Um, we saw a spike uh, in unemployment, uh, as one would expect uh, during the crisis of the past couple of years. Since then, we've seen unemployment rates uh, decline, uh, and the decline has been broad-based across uh, males, females, uh, and the youth as well. Um, so uh, when we think about labor market outcomes, we also pay attention to worker population ratios. And the increase in worker population ratios across categories, across males, females, and youth, um, uh, was uh, there was an increase in that, and it was largely actually driven by um, uh, an increase um, in unpaid uh, work, unpaid family work. Uh, and the reason I'm mentioning this is, while I've I've pointed to resilience and strength in the economy, there are still challenges. Uh, challenges when it comes to the labor market, and in particular, um, uh, what is going on with India's labor force participation rate. Um, uh, there, there's a there's a small box in our report where we look at uh, job quality as well, and and what we've note uh, what we note is that um, the job quality um, uh, perceptions that males and females all uh, have is also very different. So, um, job uh, the job quality index that uh, we look at uh, takes into account things like um, compensation, um, uh, hours worked, uh, contracts. Um, and uh, and there's a there's a growing divergence between what males uh, perceive as uh, satisfying jobs and what females feel, and there's also a, a divergence in rural and urban areas. Uh, suffice to say that uh, sorry, maybe not suffice to say, but I'll just mention that uh, females uh, uh, regularly report poorer job satisfaction and uh, job quality than and than males do across um, urban and rural areas. Um, mm -hmm. Well, now let's turn for a moment uh, to uh, inflation. Uh, we saw over the course of the last six, seven months, headline inflation come down uh, within the central bank's comfort range. So th that comfort range is between two and six percent. Uh, um, what uh, drove the recent uh, spike uh, above that range was largely food prices uh, uh, becoming elevated, elevated as a result of uh, bad weather and supply chain uh, disruptions. Um, our expectation is that those price pressures uh, on the food side are temporary. 
Um, and uh, uh, as a result, our forecast for this year is still uh, for inflation to be just below the um, upper end of the uh, RBI's threshold. And we expect our inflation to moderate over the next couple of years over our forecast horizon. Core inflation was sticky for almost two years uh, over the course of the pandemic and then started to gradually decrease. Now, um, uh, a large part of that uh, um, uh, reduction in or uh, moderation in core infl uh, inflation was due to a reduction in transport and communication costs. We've seen a spike recently, but again, um, we're expecting overall headline inflation, core inflation to be um, closer to what the central bank is comfortable with. Now, uh, let me just turn to uh, spend a moment on uh, food price pressures. Um, naturally, one would expect uh, monetary policy to come into play uh, when uh, prices are elevated. Um, and that's particularly the case uh, if there are challenges on the demand side. In this case, India's central bank has held rates steady since uh, uh, early this year. So after raising rates by 225 basis points over the course of last year in an attempt to contain some of the uh, price pressures, they've held them steady and they've consistently pointed to the fact that uh, their, their belief is that the price presses, uh, pressures that we're seeing, which are elevating inflation, are transient in nature uh, and driven by supply side issues. So what the government has done in, in response to uh, elevated inflation is introduce um, uh, measures to boost supply in the market of key commodities. Um, they've increased procurement to raise their buffer stocks. Uh, they've increased um, access to the common pool, which uh, which allows uh, increased supply in markets. Um, they're also allowing uh, farmers to sell directly. Um, hoarding prevention measure measures have also been put into place, and and. Um, uh, uh, Export uh, bans, temporary export bans, have also come into place for um, things like onions and non-basmati rice. Uh, in order to increase supply, some import duties of key commodities such as pulses have also been introduced. Now, um, whenever we think about these uh, uh, these uh, measures, particularly on the supply side, and and when when we're thinking about restrictions to trade, um, we typically like to have. Um, uh, a time horizon on these because the, uh, the the cost of this is of course not free, right? So uh, to a certain extent, um, uh, uh, we're comforted by the fact that the government is saying that these are temporary, and once prices stabilize, uh, and once perhaps some of the volatility that we're seeing in prices um, eases, uh, the expectation at the, the is that these measures will be um, um, uh, yeah, removed. Uh, and as uh, sorry. <coughs> Uh, whoops, I'm going forwards. As I said, uh, the uh, Mo Monetary Policy Committee has held rates and they're focusing very much on supporting growth. And they've also made a point of saying it will be uh, very much data uh, dependent, uh, their, their next move. Um, the health of the financial sector is something that we follow quite closely, especially given a few years ago. Um, there were there were concerns about uh, a number of uh, uh, things, including the uh, uh, non-performing assets ratio. So non-performing assets um, have fallen, and um, uh, in a positive development, they've fallen across all categories: private sector, public sector, uh, foreign banks as well. And and uh, this is largely as a result of. Um, uh, uh, an economy that is bouncing back, but also some of the re um, some of the um, reform measures that the government introduced over the past few years, uh, including uh, starting with the asset quality review that was conducted um, uh, towards 2016-17, uh, and then of course the introduction of the insolvency and bank bankruptcy code as well. Um, you, you know there are, there are always challenges when you introduce new policies, and and uh, I, and these policies are being refined further. Um, but uh, this is a, it's a bright spot and, and um, the, the developments in the banking sector, um, you know, in, across, uh, across the corporate sector, we're seeing very, very healthy profits as well uh, being recorded on a quarterly basis. Uh, Indian firms are doing particularly well and we've seen that translate into um, the performance of the stock market as well. Credit growth, um, uh, I, I, I'm going to spend a moment here because I mentioned at the start of the presentation that um, there was robust uh, domestic demand. And one of the drivers of growth uh, that, uh, over the past couple of years has been investment growth. And we're expecting investment growth to be um, robust uh, in, over the course of the next couple of years as well, 
Um, and we're seeing that translate into higher credit growth. Uh, or last uh, two years, um, there was concern that credit growth was tepid. It wasn't uh, uh, matching um, uh, what needed to be, um, uh, you know, uh, dispersed in terms of credit to grow the economy. But we're seeing that change over the past uh, year or so. And uh, again, a positive development here, especially in light of the fact that the banking sector is a lot healthier now as well. Let's turn to the external sector. Um, I mentioned a uh, challenging uh, external environment uh, at the start of my presentation. Um, major trading partner growth for India uh, has eased. So the EU, um, uh, the US, ASEAN and China, all major trading partners for India, growth in those regions has, has softened, uh, in particular, uh, what we've seen in, um, the Europe, uh, in Europe and also in uh, China. Uh, these have hurt India's exports. And as a result, the trade deficit has widened. Um, imports have also slowed, but not to the same extent that exports have collapsed. Um, uh, and and the, the slowdown in imports hasn't been as severe, uh, particularly because investment and demand for capital India as a net capital importer has remained quite strong, actually. Um, one bright spot uh, when when we think about india's external performance has been the performances uh, has been the performance of of services exports they've done quite well um uh, other uh, export categories have not done so well and in fact over the last 10 years um the export of uh, high tech goods has actually increased india's share of high tech goods exports has increased by 10 percentage points um for medium, uh, for medium tech exports, um, the share has remained somewhat stagnant and the share of exports that uh, are comprised of low tech goods has actually fallen. It's fallen uh, by uh, about seven or eight percentage points from just uh, uh, under 50 to around 40 now. Uh, that's, that's a story um, that's interesting as India um, uh, uh, tries to move up the value chain, but at the same time, um, other countries are doing uh, quite a bit as well. So in terms of global shares, India's share globally of high-tech good exports is still quite low. It's, it's only moved up uh, from 0.6 percentage points to 0.8 percentage points, even though in India, the share of exports has increased by 10 percentage points. So it's something um, uh, to pay attention to, uh, a positive development, but uh, perhaps something more can be done in that space. Foreign uh, uh, portfolio flows uh, uh, surged over the last uh, several months. This is a reflection of um, India's growth, uh, which has been quite uh, strong, as well as uh, investors seeking higher returns, uh, risk-adjusted returns. And India still offers quite an attractive proposition. Um, uh, once you take into account that uh, Europe, China, other major economies aren't perhaps doing as well as they were several months ago. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we speak about foreign portfolio inflows, um, equity flows. Uh, these are all, uh, flows that can come in and out of the country very easily. So you do see a lot more volatility there. On the foreign direct investment side, um, the story is slightly different. Yes, there's been an improvement, but, uh, uh, in, uh, FDI as a share of overall GDP is still quite low. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's only about, um, uh, 1.6 percentage points, uh, 1.6 percent of GDP. Uh, the pre pandemic level was slightly higher than where we are now. Uh, and, and this is, um, this is, uh, 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 uh this is interesting for uh, two reasons. One, um, many large countries typically do have a low share of FDI as a share of GDP. Um, uh, but India is still comparatively or relatively lower than others. And secondly, uh, with, uh, with the, uh, uh, and recent announcements, you know, recent over the past year or so about, uh, make in India with production link incentives. What does this really mean? This is an interesting discussion to have. Let me finally turn to, uh, the fiscal side. Um, I mentioned earlier, we're expecting that commitment to fiscal uh, prudence to continue. Our um, projections for the fiscal deficit, uh, is it for it to, uh, to, to narrow? Um, we're expecting uh, 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 f the fiscal deficit, uh, the general government deficit to come down from 9.6 to 9 to 8.7 and then gradually um, head down to around 8%. The general government deficit is, of course, combined with states. 
Um, and, and our uh, expectation is that the state's uh, fiscal deficits will be around 3%, given that's what their, um, uh, their, their rules uh, uh, um, uh, are. So when it comes to debt, uh, India's debt, as I said earlier, is expected to stabilize around 82% uh, of GDP. Um, I mentioned that uh, earlier that uh, we think um, India's debt uh, is sustainable, um, but I also uh, uh, mentioned that there were uh, two things to consider. The, sh um, the servicing costs in India are quite high um, relative to other emerging market peers. So debt servicing costs in India are about 5% of GDP. Across uh, other emerging market economies, they're about 3% uh, of GDP. Um, India's effective interest rate is also a little bit higher. It's about six and a half percent versus uh, about four and a half across other large economies as well. So, so from a debt servicing perspective, India, India can do better. Um, but from an overall sustainability perspective, uh, especially given um, we have robust projections for growth, uh, India's okay. Um, you know, when, oops, sorry. when we think about uh, what, what, uh, where the consolidation effort is happening, it's primarily on the expenditure side. Uh, uh, the withdrawal of uh, support measures that were put into place after COVID, they're being gradually withdrawn and uh, current spending is also being um, uh, looked at very closely. Um, the revenue performance uh, story in India is uh, one that is dominated by GST collections. GST has done particularly well. Um, but that's just one, one aspect of, of, of revenues, right? You have uh, other taxes, uh, other taxes as well to consider. And perhaps again, when you think about challenges and opportunities, that's where some, uh, where, um, India could look, uh, policymakers could look at a bit, bit, bit more closely. Finally, what does this all mean for our projections? Um, uh, it means, uh, as I said, we've got 6.3% for this fiscal year and, uh, an average around the six and a half mark for the next few years. Um, this, uh, this, uh, projection is underpinned by strong investment growth. Um, we, we see, uh, consumption, uh, moderating and perhaps picking up, uh, towards the end of our forecast, uh, period. Uh, and, and we're seeing, um, the global challenges being reflected in our exports numbers, uh, and, uh, imports numbers as well. We see, uh, exports only pick up towards the end of that cycle, um, under, uh, you know, uh, mainly because our expectation is perhaps, uh, growth will, uh, global growth and major trading path growth might, uh, might improve at the, by that stage as well. Inflation, I mentioned, uh, we expect that to come down within the central bank's uh, comfort range, um, from 5.9 this year to, uh, about four and a half, uh, and then four, uh, in the next couple of years. Um, I've, al uh, I've already mentioned what's going on on the fiscal side, so uh, I'm going to pause now and uh, I'm hoping I kept within the time limit. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we had uh, two excellent presentations. Uh, the first one was uh, on South Asia. It's doing better, but too many challenges. And the second one was on India were uh, slightly more hopeful, uh, uh, very positive on fiscal consolidation, even on inflation management. Uh, so um, you have a slightly, you know, a tonal quality is a little different from the first and the second. And uh, so therefore I will, with these uh, introductory comments, I will hand it over to Rini. And uh, 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 so, so you take 10 minutes and uh, Dr. Golnar takes uh, the 10 minutes. Just Please. give me a buzzword gesture. No, no. I mean, you have, you have Spill over. Yeah, sure. Thank you for the very interesting presentations. And both were... Okay. It was wonderful. So I'm not going to waste any time uh, on the... So let me just, I have a number of remarks on the India update and uh, lesser ones on the South Asia ones. So without much uh, wastage of time, I'll chew talk to straight. Uh, broadly, I agree with uh, some of your assumptions or projections for the near term, which is the deceleration of consumption. I agree with that. Uh, I am more guarded on private investment and uh, even for this year recovery and the uh, year forward uh, in the, um, uh, in, over the, into the medium term. 
uh, I agree with the fact that there is the capacity for investments in terms of uh, improvement and deleveraging and improvement of banks and corporate balance sheets has improved. But then you have to see ahead as to what the ag aggregate demand is. And uh, your own projections show that the external demand is projected to slow down. And uh, but there is a lot of because consumption is decelerated, is seen to be decelerating. So where is this uh, 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 the enticement for investment, private investment recovery come from? There are other indicators which itself I saw in the development update. For example, the slack in the labor market is enormous because real uh, wages have either been stagnant or falling. And uh, much of this stagnation and the decline comes from the non-farm uh, real wages. And that testifies to the extent of the slap, slack in the labor market. The second uh, indication of where this slack would be coming from is uh, the segment uh, in services on the GVA side, which is this uh, trade, transport, hospitality, etc., etc., which is the largest, uh, biggest segment, uh, segment which uh, provides uh, uh, non-farm uh, jobs, urban as well as even in the rural uh, areas. Uh, jobs like logistics or trade, transport, etc. Now the recovery in this segment is actually, if, we, if I look at it relative to uh, pre-pandemic levels, it's just 4% above in real terms. And compared to that, the construction sector uh, has risen about 19% uh, uh, above pre-pandemic levels. So whatever little bit of uh, job creation might be happening, it seems, is that. So there is a bit of discordance that I find in your optimism or uh, uh, maybe uh, optimistic uh, assumptions about services sector growth. Uh, because if we see it's largely construction, some see construction as part of industry, some see it's part of services, but overall that and the financial sector, where, you know, uh, which is not great uh, of a services provider. So that is one thing. And then if we see the base of the aggregate demand, the marginal propensities to consume are the biggest at the lower income levels. And these are the uh, low income daily informal job creation which happens there. So that's one aspect. On the external side, again, external demand is seen to be slowing. So one of the, uh, the main thing, if we see India's historical trend of private investment, then it is closely, uh, it, it, there's a close co-movement between capacity utilization in manufacturing segment and, uh, and the rate of uh, private investment or growth of private investment. So that is, it. And the third thing is to look at financing side. I think that that tells us something to merely be looking at bank credit growth as an indicator of robust demand is a bit, uh, uh, it's incomplete because uh, we have to look at the overall, there is a huge amount, enormous amount of credit substitution from the non-bank domestic sources. External financing has actually pretty much dried up because with negative outflows on the commercial borrowing side last year. And that is directly to do with the adverse turn in the global environment, rising interest rates and continuing depreciation pressures upon the rupee. So it's no longer remunerative, remunerative uh, for domestic firms to borrow abroad. So there's going to be, uh, given the large levels of government bo uh, borrowing, so you know, one of the question is that we're looking at quantities, but what happening to prices? There's no upward pressure upon interest rates, domestic interest rates. So that's the question. And does that tell us that private demand or uh, domestic demand is, may not be as robust as it as we as commonly perceived from high frequency uh, indicators? OK, so next, let me just move to the public debt side, uh, which is public investment. Uh, I think it's very, fairly evident it's run out of steam. It's been supporting propping growth for the last several eight years, seven, eight years, effectively since uh, the collapse of private investment in 2012-13. So what we are finding, what we are seeing is that the multiplier effect for whatever reason is either not, is not evident or it's not great. Although regression coefficients show us, you know, two or whatever the value of two, but the fact is that it isn't big enough to generate 
enough consumption because consumption is continuously decelerating much before COVID as well and private investment is not coming back. So uh, it could be to do with efficiency of in public investment that is there or uh, the capacity. But public debt is uh, one is a lot of uh, has been the decline has been driven by nominal GDP which exactly the your report says for South Asia as well as that's correct. But going forward because of the extreme price uh, collapse in the wholesale price index. So nominal GDP is going to decline. So I'm afraid that's going to be a very big, very big constraint on public spending. Uh, about fiscal consolidation, I I, tend to, I think it's important to look at actuals and where does this commitment come from. Commitment isn't enough for fiscal deficit. And if we see last year's uh, FY23 correction, well, it's none of it is commitment because uh, A, it is, there are two main drivers where it come from. As you suggest, uh, as you mentioned that uh, one of is it, uh, the withdrawal of pandemic uh, support measures. But the second was from price corrections, fertilizer subsidy. So, you know, that's not structural. So there's no structural consolidation. And to the other, uh, rather, to on the other side, we find that subsidies or welfare spending in under, you know, various schemes is actually going on increasing. So there isn't. And then third, if we look at the NHAI debt, that is huge. It's more than 3.6 trillion. So where is the public investment going to come from? It has no legs, no steam left anymore. And uh, it is, it's a huge concern as to, you know, where is growth going to come from in the, um, uh, in the period ahead, in the medium term. I have a one remark or two remarks on the external sector. Just looking at the Q1 figures, um, I think there's reason to be concerned about that because the aggregate services have gone up roughly year on year in the first quarter. The increase is about 4 billion more. It's essentially driven by business services. But then if we see on the other uh, element of the current account, there's also 2 billion outflow, which is on net income side. And the remittances are essentially flat. Remittances also co-move with global GDP growth in the respective countries where they come from. So uh, there could be a financing uh, issue at some point or huge net FTI has declined. So that's not a mainstay. So the dependency on the fickle or the short term hot money is uh, increased extensively. And given that the exchange rate is depreciating and India is trying very hard to not raise interest rates and the yield differential has narrowed to so much, it's going to be a tough walk. Of course, the CAD would be could be pruned because if growth declines, then imports would also decline. So you have both situations scenario where exports and imports both sort of come down together, and the current account uh, deficit is kept in check. Okay, now the outlook bit. Here I have a major question, which is that one of the benchmarks uh, that can be used to look at the medium-term growth outlook is to visualize or to assess as to where the, we see the level of output. Do we see it at the same level as pre-pandemic levels or do we see it somewhere below uh, lower, that is a trend decline, and then its distribution, of course, that's where, where it is located. So uh, I don't know what the World Bank's uh, pre-pandemic uh, potential output assumptions were, but I think in this one I read that it's between six to six and a half percent. So you see uh, growth is seen, um, real GDP growth is seen somewhere slightly below potential output in FI24, FI25. So that means that you don't perceive or foresee any kind of permanent output destruction due to the pandemic. So, but if we see that in FY20, that is the first pre-pandemic year, growth had dropped to 3.9% with causes that are still remaining mysterious after a three year long slowdown. So no one knows whether it was structural or cyclical and where it came from. So that's a huge rebound. But typically if you see in deep recessions, there is a V-shaped recovery and then growth reaches a peak because there's a V and then it's either a decline and it settles at a lower trend and that is a permanent trend but rarely is it seen that you know there is a rebound or sometimes there's a w but then there is another dip so let's see about that finally on the debt bit i'm running out of time on the debt bit uh, on south asia this that is a concern you're optimistic about india how it has proven but there are always incipient pressures and technically india may not default because 95 percent of its debt is domestic but we have uh, problems on that. And in a way, any kind of exchange of maturity of debt 
rollover is technically indicates that in inability at that point in, at that point of the economic cycle to meet one's obligations. Uh, green jobs, I'm a bit little uh, surprised at 9% only are non-green or pollution intensive. All the rickshaw pullers, everybody works in very high dust pollution and all that, and a lot of jobs are there. So overall, my one remark uh, before I end, because I'm getting these suggestions <laughs> from AKP, which is that uh, South Asia's uh, debt problem, yes, it is a huge problem. And coming as it does because of the, you know, past history is so discouraging of debt resolutions or, you know, any kind of fresh thing. Uh, maybe coming from the World Bank as it does, it's time to, it thought of something given China's intransigence on uh, debt resolution, have some kind of a, another second HIPC or whatever, at least for the low and some of the middle income countries. Otherwise, global economic growth is not going to happen in the way that we visualize or for that matter, the green transition. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. I think, be careful, be careful, yeah, yeah. Um, I think many interesting points uh, which uh, to which we'll come back later. Uh, may I request uh, Amrita to, sure, please, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, oh, oops, okay. Okay, so uh, it's always a good idea to start with some disclaimers. So I am by profession an energy and climate change economist, so that will be my vantage point of discussing the two reports. Um, both the reports, so the key word there is update. So in terms of providing a snapshot view of the economy, I found both uh, reports to be extremely rich in terms of the coverage of issues. Some of the topics, uh, again, uh, I read with a lot of interest, specifically the one on political budget cycles, as well as the cost of sovereign debt defaults, with a lot of interest, but professionally not technically qualified to talk about it or give very insightful comments. But where I'm coming from, and specifically my topics, uh, would be related to issues or of mitigation, adaptation, climate loss and damage, etc. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my interventions or comments into three broad buckets. Um, and these sort of follow the order in which they appear in the report as well. Um, the first comment that I want to make, and this is something that was shown in the presentation also, uh, about how climate change is a key risk to the region. Very important point to mention, and the inclusion of both energy transition as well as climate change uh, take the report one step up in the sense that in addition to providing a snapshot view, it becomes forward looking as well, because you are not only talking about what is happening right now, you're also focusing on what could potentially happen in the future and you're taking that into account, which is, I think, a plus in my books. Uh, some points that I wanted to mention and again relating to this. Uh, yes, the region is extremely at risk, very vulnerable to climate threats. But something that I found in the report, because you have these sections that go from one to the other, and you have a section which discusses the climate risks for most of the uh, countries in the region. And the very next section talks about uh, public investments being strategically placed, uh, how it can be made effective, how it can lead to high quality infrastructure that can crowd in private investment, pertinent points. But something that I found missing and that might be considered for maybe the next iteration is maybe a reference made to resilient infrastructure and how that presents an excellent opportunity. So there is, and I would quote another World Bank study, which is, I would say, for me, a, 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 a benchmark of sorts, which is called Lifelines. And it looks at four essential infrastructure systems, power, water supply, sanitation, transport, and telecommunication. This report also talks about facilitative infrastructure, which is basically these four infrastructures itself. So the point here that I want to underscore and probably want to uh, highlight in my discourse is that 
Despite the flagging of jet to GDP ratio as an important issue that uh, the South Asian region needs to think about, the point that is not discussed very often is that the cost or the incremental cost of making infrastructure resilient is not very high. Actually, this study found that the incremental cost is only 3%. So it will not add to burden a lot, but in terms of the benefits that you recoup, uh, in terms of maybe um, uh, uh, benefits of not having your business disrupted, not having households that have to sort of incur a lot of losses, specifically uh, people living in the informal settlements. So the benefits could be as much as $4 to $1 spent on resiliency. It's amazing. So I think uh, for this report also, because it's making the connection, this link between resiliency or resilient design of infrastructure and the uh, vulnerability of the region needs to be sort of woven into the narrative. And just maybe I'm belaboring the point a little bit, also something that could be mentioned and I was uh, when I was reading through the report, there is a mention of co-benefits. Again, when we go for resilient infrastructure, there could be mitigation benefits also. So there is a lot of discussion on nature-based solutions, how that could be the answer. You have mitigation benefits that come as a co-benefit. So it's, in my books, it's a win-win strategy that needs more people talking about it, more people emphasizing it. Uh, the second part that I want to talk about uh, is this piece on recruiting firms for energy transition. Uh, really interesting and I would want to sort of commend the authors because I was looking through the econometric modeling was done. So they take different modeling techniques, different country standpoints and sort of meld it all together. In fact, there were some uh, I think uh, sections uh, where the authors had mentioned that it was one of the first kind done for the South Asia region, which is excellent. Uh, but there were some points that I wanted to highlight. First is based on my understanding or our ground level un understanding of how energy efficiency is progressing. So we very recently, when I say we, I mean the ICREA team, when we did a study on green steel, so green steel is all that, commanding heights, backbone of the economy, everything. So when we talked about them, about why you're not going in for energy efficiency, because that is in the MAC curve or the marginal abatement cost curve, one of the negative cost options, they said that most of the gains that could be made have already been made. So where do you go? So the next quantum leap would either come in for new technologies that the report also mentions, or involving the MSME sectors. That is, I think, a big missing gap that I saw. So the econometric framework that is there accounts for size. But what would really interest me as a reader is maybe parsing of the data. And uh, just wanted to highlight that the authors have done an excellent job. So they are looking at a large panel data of ASI, so the Annual Survey of Indri in, uh, Industries from 2001 to 2008. So it's, it's no mean feat. So I know what sort of hard work is required for it. But the point is that if you pass off the data to look at the big guys and the small guys, <coughs> I have a feeling the story is going to be very different. So that needs to be highlighted. Uh, the second point is that most of the large guys are already covered. You have the PATH scheme, you have newly rolled out carbon credit schemes. It is the MSMEs that are going to be the problem. Not the problem, but at least the people who will have the greatest cost if you want to follow the energy transition pathway. And Indians by default are extremely cost conscious. So how would that come about? And Francesca in her presentation has given us cost effective measures that could work for a country like India. But there are some asks if uh, the authors so feel that could be included maybe in later iterations. So first question that I would want to pose to the authors is, is it possible to look at ra rather than a static vision of what led to energy efficiency gains, but rather decomposing the energy efficiency gains into gains from investment augmentation. So obviously, if a, if a company or a firm goes for high tech uh, investment, high tech plant and machinery versus labor scaling. So if a delta X marginal impact could be computed, that would be excellent because then you sort of unraveling the puzzle because there is some gains from labor skilling, some gains from uh, labor productivity, etc. And there are some gains from just capital intensive, heavy investment driven uh, uh, in, uh, energy efficiency gains. Uh, 
The other thing that I wanted to talk about is that it is possible, again, as a wearing my researcher hat, it is difficult to do this with ASI. Now, ASI is extremely tricky for people who worked with it because with panel data, it only covers enterprises that have 100 plus uh, uh, workers. So you might lose out on the really small guys. So 100 plus are uh, 100 plus employment uh, for units that are sort of recorded every year. But for smaller guys, they maybe are recorded once in every three years. So difficult to do, but at least for a smaller set. So this, again, a suggestion for firms employing 100 to 250 employees. So this is one part of the tail, right? This is maybe the medium to the, uh, not the micro ones, but small to medium enterprises. If this can be shown, it would be really good. Uh, my next point is with respect to information behavioral nudges, specifically uh, this uh, Bangladesh experience. Yeah, it was really very thought provoking. This issue of geographical proximity to adopters, the exposure effects, as the reporter calls it, really interesting. And it sort of uh, started my own sort of thinking on the same that I better work on this further. So maybe there could be a Goldar et al. paper very soon on the same topic. <laughs> okay, and the last point that I want to make is about the green jobs definitions. Um, sorry to be a little critical here, but the way that this energy transition piece ends does not naturally or organically lead to the green jobs piece. Now, why I'm saying this is because the green jobs definition I felt was a little too diffused. You are covering a lot many. So when we're talking about energy transition, in my head, we are talking about renewable energy. We are talking about energy efficiency. Uh, we are probably talking a little bit about forestry. But the report covers green jobs in a more diffused manner. It covers repair. It covers recycling. Yes, environmental protection also, which might make the results a little hard to decipher, in my opinion. Same thing goes for polluting jobs as well, because polluting jobs, you're covering not just enterprises that are emitting GHGs, but also enterprises that are uh, spewing out local pollutants. So the usual socks, NOx, etc. So again, a little diffuse. So what I would wish for is if this could be made a little streamlined, it flows very naturally, where you're talking about energy transition, the costs in terms of just an equitable transition, and you're talking also about the jobs, the jobs that are getting created and the jobs that are getting lost. So it, it all balances out in my head. Uh, this issue about gainers and losers, I think it, it, it is a very important point. So there is a spatial dimension to energy transition. Not all states or not all subnational governments would win. So how would the losers be compensated and how can the winners adjust to this new normal of high RE, high energy efficiency jobs? Because you have these sort of, I think this is a call to arms to all urban folks there, because you have these cities that are bustling with new labor that is coming in from the states uh, that have suddenly lost their jobs, their livelihoods that are coming into your cities. How do you plan for the same? And for energy efficiency specifically, which I deem might be more localized, how do you train the existing folks? So skilling, reskilling, upskilling is going to be the buzzwords, which might uh, sort of uh, be the key point here. And I will sort of uh, stop here with some shameless self-promotion. Uh, Ikrir also is doing some work on this because we are looking at a multi-region input-output table trying to bring in a state level CG model, looking at labor mobility. In fact, for our works, we are focusing on certain resource rich states that are doing well with respect to both RE as well as energy efficiency jobs. So for us, our work, we have focused on Rajasthan, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, uh, Madhya Pradesh and Telangana. And we are sort of focusing on how the skill labor or how these skilling policies need to come about at a subnational level. So hopefully by November, we will have our work ready also. Uh, I think, and I welcome you to that. So last, I will end with uh, sage advice from a senior colleague at Ikrir. He said, Amrita, soon there will be no economists. 
they will only be climate change economists. <laughs> so take that as you will. So I finish with that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amrita. Wonderful. Uh, I, I think uh, we had uh, two two uh, responses uh, from our discussions, very perceptive. Uh, and it will be very unfair on my part if I don't give an opportunity to both Francisca as well as to Dhruv uh, to respond to some of the questions that our discussants uh, raised. Uh, and uh, uh, if I may, I will add uh, two or three of my points, uh, uh, which will uh, probably add and amplify to what uh, Renu has pointed out. Uh, one is uh, that uh, there was this sense that uh, the government supply measures have worked uh, but uh, are there uh, are there income costs associated with those supply measures and what is that actually uh, if they have worked in terms of keeping prices but there's also the cost consequences in terms of farmers income now how, how does that get squared up that's number one and number two is uh, that the fiscal consolidation uh, commitment uh, which Renu has already raised some doubts on uh, is also riding uh, a lot more on the states. Uh, it is not so much loaded in favor of the center. So is, is there something that we need to look at? And finally, I would say that uh, the, the big elephant in the room is oil. And I don't know whether we have looked at the oil prices and how it is going to impact uh, the prices. So I will first ask Kandiska to respond. Uh, to the questions, uh, some of the questions of extra cost on energy transition, green jobs, and then go to the group to respond to the question that I had raised. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a great discussion. Thank you very much. Um, I want to go back to one thing that Reno mentioned on the private investment weakness. This is something that doesn't just affect India. You see it around South Asia. Literally every country where we can find the data has had private sector investments grow slowing from the pre-pandemic average. And in some countries like India, it's been offset by very strong public investment. But India is not the only one. The question is then, of course, like you're mentioning, how long can that be sustained? And what are the, what's the collateral damage that comes with it? You know, the, the growing borrowing costs, etc. Um, then I want to get back to several of the points that Amita, Amita mentioned. So thank you. Thank you very much. Very good points. Um, this infrastructure, resilient infrastructure is actually a really important part of the energy transition. Now, I have to confess that the energy transition is a vast topic. We are taking this one sliver of firms. How can we prod firms? But there is a major public sector component to it that, of course, we're completely disregarding here. What we're saying is that firms have their bit to do and government can prod them, but government has its own role, and that's where resilient infrastructure comes in. So we'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> we're still working on it. Um, the, and you mentioned also the core benefits, and I wish I had mentioned them actually in my remarks, because those are really important. This is not just about the energy transition. This is about reducing reliance on fuel imports just as much. No? You're mentioning the oil price. It's a major vulnerability for many parts of the region. They're all importing oil. So that's one of the benefits of the energy transition, just Using having... technology instead. Yeah. <laughs> But at least uh, the, it's a different kind of import. When you import a solar panel from China, like Germany does all the time, no, all the solar panels come from China, it's a one-off capital investment, and then the running doesn't constantly require imports. So you can go for a little while without, even if your borders suddenly close, you can go for a little while because you have to capture and you're generating your own en uh, energy. Whereas if you constantly, every month you need the energy imports, it's a different kind of dependence on the, on the outside world. So one benefit of the energy transition is, is actually reducing this dependence. Another benefit is job creation. What we find in the ASI data is that actually the firms that have been improving their energy intensity more than the median, those are the ones who created more jobs. What they seem to have done is they've become more efficient in one dimension, energy efficiency, and they've invested that into job creation. So we're hoping that this is a broader pattern that then applies to others as well. The third is, of course, simple productivity gains. No? And with productivity gains comes growth. 
and of course the pollution you know, that, that's that's sort of a motivating factor but there, there are actually four core benefits to this to this energy transition it's not just about energy transition you're perfectly right on the big firms or small firms the problem is the small firms the big firms they are the ones that are the leaders they're, they're implementing new technologies they they have access to technology they can import it they can they can interact with it they can buy it you know they can invent it they have research departments the big firms are fine the issue is the small firms and that's where we hope our rct can or where we, where our rct our randomized control trial gives us some hope because we deliberately picked 500 little firms little leather industry sewing firms in bangladesh and we found that they, they catch on very quickly once they realize there's some profit to be had they catch on very quickly it's just that investing in that first bit of information is costly. So if one of them discovers the information with a new meter and a new motor, the others immediately, uh, they, they act, you know, they, they need profits. Um, and finally, the gains and uh, losers, that's an important dimension. It's not just the, the type of workers that are concentrated or pollution intensive jobs are not just concentrated among a certain type vulnerable type of worker. Pollution intensive jobs are also concentrated geographically, modern green jobs. And there, you, you're right, what we do in the chapter is a stock take, because that's all the data allows us to do. So to do something more forward looking, we looked at all the past regional um, structural transformations. So the obvious ones, resource, resource booms. Happens around the world, happens in China, happens in India, happened in India in the 90s, happened in, uh, well, structural transformation, maybe not resource boom. But structural tr transformations happen around the world and there's a big literature around it where you can actually extract lessons. And what we find is that a resource boom, you know, what we are hoping is happening in these, in green, in these regions that can really leverage green technologies, the resource boom, brings big employment gains, a rush of migration into the region, doesn't do much for wages, because there is this massive influx of labor, but it does generate employment. A resource bust, like what might happen to the regions who that ha rely heavily on pollution intensive jobs, a resource bust comes as lasting employment losses and earnings losses, and they really last. That's the difference to a boom. A boom gives you transitory gains while the boom lasts, and then it's over. And then comes a really lasting loss of employment and wages. A lot of workers never manage to escape it. There's a whole generation of workers who was lost when there's a research bust, a resource bust. Not just in the US, in the coal areas, not just in Europe, but even in, in places like China, for example. Very hard to manage. It's, it's a big task for governments to at least let people vote with their feet, you know, help them out so they don't get stuck in this past. That's it on my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I turn to Dhruv? <clears throat> thank you. And, and, and uh, thank you for the very uh, uh, thought-provoking uh, um, uh, points that you raised. Let me just start with, um, uh, let, me, let me split it up uh, uh, so that in the interest of time into three things. Let me start with um, uh, your point about uh, consumption and perhaps the, the fact that um, the, the headline numbers may be masking some of the uh, challenges. And, and um, I think we would agree that uh, there is a K-shaped recovery. Uh, the, you know, growth in consumption is largely being driven by higher income earners. And, we, and, and you know, our, our tapering story uh, of consumption is largely driven by the fact that we expect that pent up demand to wane now. Um, and of course, this has implications for um, uh, poorer households, uh, particularly in rural areas. So, so the, um, um, you know, I, I agree with the overall thing that the numbers are masking what is going on in terms of composition. Um, construction uh, sector is doing very well. Yes, you pointed that out as well. Um, uh, the real estate sector, um, uh, you know, there's uh, there's signs that that's um, uh, also recovering. Um, Capacity utilization has actually increased um, when it comes to hospitality and uh, the travel sector as well. Not as high as it could have been uh, or it was before, but uh, increasing. So um, there's a two-paced recovery, if you like. Certain sectors doing uh, quite well and, and very well, in fact, and others not doing so well. 
um, and sometimes the headline numbers don't uh, don't really uh, show that. And 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 a point taken about perhaps uh, in, in the text, uh, we can bring out some of these nuances, uh, uh, especially you know in, uh, perhaps in the next edition. Um, uh, you spoke briefly about uh, um, uh, a fiscal on the fiscal side as well. Um, uh, and you mentioned multipliers. So uh, we did do some work um, on multipliers. We we actually estimated um, the public infrastructure investment multiplier to be in the range of between two and two and a half and four and a half. So that basically means for every rupee that the government spends on infrastructure, um, GDP could increase by two and a half and four and a half. And I know and we, I know that that's a very large number. And there are several challenges when it comes to estimation and so on. But if you look at the literature. Um, it, it's it, it's it's not far off. In fact, it's not far off from what the uh, RBI itself has done uh, when it uh, when it comes up with this research. Where the challenge is, and, it, and you noted this in your remarks, is that it's the quantum public share of infrastructure, but public investment is still very low, right? So you need the private sector to step in. And our empirical work shows that um, uh, in many emerging markets, and in, uh, and this includes India, in, uh, in fact, that there's actually a crowding in effect. So having the public uh, sector step in when it comes to infrastructure investment could actually crowd in private sector um, involvement. And yes, there are there are still challenges, and we uh, we know that there are challenges. I mean, um, for the private sector to step in, it's not only about the public sector stepping in, but also it's also about broader reform. Access to longer sources of financing is pr uh, critical when it comes to uh, these longer term projects, and that perhaps is an area where India could improve. G going to domestic sources, asking for 30, 20 year loans, whatever that. Could certainly uh, uh, is an area that uh, we could see improvements in. Um, on the state side, I mean, there's still uh, there's still space for um, there's still uh, some scope for states to do more. In fact, yes, there's a limit of three; uh, they can go up to three and a half percent on the fiscal mm -hmm. side. But last year we sh we saw them uh, uh, the deficit number to be two point seven percent. So states are constantly close to or underperforming when it comes to that side. And that large, you know, there are several reasons for this, including capacity uh, to spend, execution, um, you know, a, a whole host of challenges, but perhaps a discussion for later. So a little bit of scope there. Um, uh, you mentioned um, uh, concerns when it comes to fiscal consolidation. You mentioned uh, NHAI. Um, so look, consolidation is happening. Even though um, uh, the NHAI uh, um, spending has been brought on onto budget, and so even though it's been brought onto the budget, we're still seeing consolidation. So perhaps um, our our um, our comfort in the consolidation story is uh, it, it, you know it, is partly because of that reason as well. Um, uh, and finally, I, I know we're short on time, so I'm, uh, the other big question was about potential. Uh, potential growth and where we see India. So you're right. Um, uh, we see India around the six percent mark right now, and um, you could always argue that um, uh, you know it should be closer to seven, closer to be eight, or it's less than that. And and where the pressures will be absorbed if India is growing at potential, um, there's not much room to go faster. Otherwise, prices will increase. But we also, in addition to thinking about uh, India, India's growth prospects in the short term, we also think about India growth prospects in the longer term. And there, perhaps a more interesting story emerges. Um, if India's uh, aspirations of becoming a high-income country is to be met, um, by 2040, 47, India would like to be a high-income country, then it needs to grow at eight. So there, this whole question about potential, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, comes into play as well. But to go, the real question is, how does India go from six to eight? Um, right. And and uh, our and one point I'd like to also note is our estimates of potential also take into account the learning losses that have occurred over the past few years. Right. What has gone on on the, on the labor side of the economy? Uh, th these are impacts that will have an impact, a, a longer term impact on um, uh, potential growth. But that is dispersed over the medium to long term horizon. So the real question is, how does India go from six to eight? I feel, uh, and, and it's far. It, it's a very, um, it, it's a provocative question, and it's also interesting because uh, um, there are so many different things that India could do. Uh, I mentioned female labor force participation. That's of course uh, one important aspect of that conversation. If you're not utilizing a large proportion of your population uh, to get from six to eight, is going to be very difficult. Um, on that slightly uh, somber note, I'm going to pause. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me sh take, take five more minutes because we are behind schedule. Uh, you know, uh, such a uh, wonderful audience here. 
some questions from them uh, to the panel here. Uh, we'll love to have them and uh, get them addressed. Please identify yourself uh, and uh, ask your question. Sir, uh, with everyone's permission, we can, we should, I think we should have a longer Q&A. We can take up 10, 15 minutes. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I mean, sort of, no? Okay. Uh, so, questions from the floor? Yeah, please. This is a question to Joe. Larry Summers spoke the other day as well as gave an interview. gave an interview in the Economic Times uh, where it's uh, talking about India being able to achieve 8% growth. And when the question was asked to him, he said it can be done. Now, how do you think it can be done? Number one. Number two is question to Francisca. Uh, the question which is an issue which arose, and this is something which is troublesome, is the deficit from the states. As of today, states are all in kind of rush to give freebies, and most of the states, uh, most of the states, not all, are in uh, quite sort of deep trouble, I would say, fiscally. So how do you think it is going to impact in the overall uh, sense uh, as we go along? And how does it relate to uh, the other factors uh, which we've been talking about? Thank you. We'll take three questions at a time uh, and then get them answered, uh, Mr. Bhagwati. Yeah. And after that, uh, yeah. I think everyone around the room, can you hear me? Yes. I would agree that getting prices right is basic to any kind of sustained economic endeavor. I noticed, uh, this is to both the presenters, I noticed that you spoke about domestic interest rates, nominal interest rates, but I may have missed it, but I did not see any reference to rupees external price, which is nothing but its exchange rate. Now, we all know that exchange rates can quickly get political because the US Treasury uh, watches it puts countries on what it calls an exchange rate watch. Some seven years ago, I'd done a study and we looked at total factor productivity. Given that our, our meaning Indian rupee nominal interest rates are way higher than most developed country currencies, one would expect not that Fisher's theorem, interest rate parity, would hold on an ex post basis, it only holds on an ex ante basis, you would expect the rupee to steadily depreciate both nominally and in real terms. I'm not convinced, the only reason it would not happen, <clears throat> pardon me, is if our productivity is much higher than that of developed countries. I've looked at some OECD numbers, and I looked at some other numbers, there's nothing to show that Indian productivity is much higher than that of developed countries. So I would posit that this is something that the World Bank should do on its own, build up its own database and its own numbers on TFP, and then uh, assess whether, whether a country's exchange rate is where it should be, because I think this is one of the important factors in terms of our external balances, getting our exchange rate right. And my understanding, and I'll stop here, is that the rupee is at present about 10% overvalued at a minimum. Third question before you come to the panel. Yeah. You know, Sagal is my name. Where does the aviation sector come into this? Because there's going to be rapid growth and it is going to impinge on all that has been said. Comments. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I think the first question was mostly. Oh, oh sorry. Deficits in states. How do? Deficit, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. How do? Um, how should they adjust? Um, you know, I think this is actually better asked to Drew. I'm not yeah, sure okay. about the, the within yeah, okay. the industry. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so let me start. Uh, uh, 
and I don't often get an opportunity to do this, uh, uh, but I, I'm going to ask uh, Augusto to come in for one of these things. Uh, um, uh, it's on the Larry Summers point. Look, uh, we, we, we are spending some time internally to look at how India can go from six to eight. Um, uh, in short, one of the things um, uh, that I mentioned earlier about female labor force participation is certainly an important part of that. Um, India's labor force participation rate, whichever way you cut the numbers and um, look at them, it, it is lower not only um, uh, uh, in absolute terms, but relative terms too. Um, how you can get uh, labor, uh, labor force participation rates for females to increase, there's a whole host of things. One thing, is, one thing to note is that it, it's not only the social dimension that we should be considering, it's also um, the economic dimension. Um, so, so there's an economic cost of not having females in the labor force. Um, you know, I, I mentioned in my presentation that um, the worker population ratio uh, and for females had been increasing, but this was largely as a result of unpaid work, right? So, so um, we have demand side problems, we have supply side problems, and all of these need to be addressed holistically. Uh, one simple um, uh, uh, policy solution, uh, well, it's not simple, but one thing that the government could consider, and it's been considered in many countries, is to think about what, what hurdles are there for females entering the workforce. I can give you one example, which is transport. Simple thing is having safe and secure transport to even get to work. Um, uh, uh, evidence from other places where they've done experiments, adding some, uh, something as simple as uh, uh, lighting at bus stops, which makes it, uh, which makes it uh, safer for females to transport because not everyone is taking their own personal transport to work. So, it's, uh, you know, I, I use the word simple, but it's not simple. Um, uh, uh, suggestions like this could help. Um, increasing um, uh, uh, um, infrastructure investment, uh, we've already talked about that, that has gains in the longer term. So we're hoping that some of the uh, investments that have been made over the past few years, and those are very large numbers, will eventually have payoffs when it comes to growth as well. And the question about, uh, you, you mentioned um, uh, uh, total factor, uh, sorry, total factor productivity. You also mentioned that productivity, of course, um, in the, uh, I'll give you one example. Productivity in the agriculture sector is still quite low, and uh, uh, and the agriculture sector is a large part of India's uh, growth story as well, and um, it hasn't done well. So there are there's still room to improve when it comes to productivity as well. On Larry Summers specifically, I'm going to pass to August because I understand uh, you you uh, met him recently, so maybe you've got <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll keep that for my closing remarks. Okay. In the interest of time. Yeah. Um, uh, and anything about the aviation sector? Um, uh, to be honest, sir, I don't have any information about uh, specific information about the aviation uh, sector, other than a lot of the investments that are being made more recently um, is to improve connectivity and reduce logistics costs. So we are seeing a lot more um, uh, flights to second tier cities. We're seeing a lot more happening, uh, airports being built there as well. Um, and and that, uh, that is all part of the growth story. In terms of numbers, I don't have them at the moment. Discuss today. So, uh, uh, look, one of the biggest uh, costs that India faces, um, and this is something that the World Bank president has also made uh, remarks about, is about logistics costs. Improving, uh, reducing logistics costs, which in India, I, my understanding is are about 13 or 14 percent of GDP. If you reduce those, you boost trade, you boost incomes. All of these things have spillover effects that are positive uh, for India's growth uh, uh, on, uh, you know, in real GDP terms as also on per capita terms as well and integration into regional and global value chains, of course, as well, um, uh, all part of that story. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Amarjit and I dabble in the social sector. I would just like to raise an issue on the 6 to 8 bit which was mentioned at the end because a lot of what you said before that we've heard the, the responses of the discussants as also your comments and more or less uh, the pictures there. But in the context of what's been happening in India, I just want to understand on the 6 to 8 movement that you said at the end, how do you expect this to happen? I think uh, I have very fundamental four simple issues which are emerging from where we have been able to reach so far in India. How chronic poverty is not that much uh, a challenge as it was say 15 years ago as UNDP's report pointed out. So basically I could see four areas where perhaps some nudge through evidence-based research and works of this kind can help. 
One is the challenge of how do you create quality employment with respectable wages and incomes. And, and that, uh, what is it that needs to change, needs to come out clearly. Similarly, on the human capital deficits, there is silence on the human capital deficits, even in the medium term. I think it's a big, big issue. We don't seem to be addressing the quality of incomes and the respectable income wages issue adequately. The third, which is related again, is the decentralized governance and financing reforms for our quality outcomes in the what are the public goods, so to say, education, health, legal system, and so on. These have implications now for the six to eight, even in the short run, because these seem to be sectors where we have not given the attention we needed to. So a nudge in these studies on where, how do we move from six to eight? And the fourth point I wish to make is with regard to the reforms that we need, whether it is to do with food fertilizer subsidies, whether it is to do with the MSP challenges, the entire governance of subsidies and where possible yeah. changes are. These are Thank the you. Issues like. The question here. You, Mike there. Thank you very much. My name is Hyanji Ban, Chief of Social Policy with UNICEF India. So thank you so much uh, for bringing the point about learning loss. And also Mr. Sina has also alluded to the importance of human capital. Um, because we have a lot of evidence that shows if you invest in the early years from zero to six, where, where we call it the cognitive capital, uh, there's a huge return on economic and social, there's a huge social and economic return. And I know that World Bank has uh, in the past also been working on this and con continue to work on this. And I, I just wanted to point out a recent study that UNICEF did. Uh, they compared the spending patterns of 84 countries in low income and middle income country. And high income country spends much higher around the ages of birth, uh, including preschool and uh, and they have seen huge gains. And we also allude to the importance of, you mentioned female uh, forced uh, labor participation, uh, the importance issue of investing in care economy. So affordable childcare, family friendly practices. And you've seen this in many countries, including like in Norway, where they invested over a 50 years period, quality and affordable childcare and uh, you know, family-friendly uh, policies like parental leave and maternity and child uh, grants, they've seen multiple, multiple increases in GDP growth. So I think it's a very important policy recommendation to make. Second point is around, uh, Francesca, thank you for bringing the point about the climate risk and the importance of looking at social protection systems. Um, I think in addition to uh, for the, I mean, I think it's critical if we look at three sectors of growth, we often, even in the G20, right, they call the green economy, digital economy, and the care economy. I think for that transition, I think social protection for informal workers, especially in the context of India, where I think 80% of women are in the informal workforce, um, I think is critical. And I think okay. that could be a key policy recommendation that should be highlighted further. Uh, so let me stop here because I... Sure. Thank yeah, you. The third time. question from this round and then we'll have another but round. Very informative yeah, presentations. Ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Anupam Karna. I worked 30 years at the World Bank when all of you were just joining, I suppose. And, but the last decade in India, now I'm back in Washington, focusing more on technology, China, and US. So based on that, let me just start with the question I have on the first one, because the, your thing rests on three pillars. The analytic framework depends on three sets of numbers. One was the China slowdown, which you took as the first hit, uh, first risk. And secondly, your parameters regarding energy efficiency and labor market, two things that I've been looking at. So number one, what is your slowdown scenario for China? Is it the closer to Adam Posen, who's already in the middle versus Nick Lardy, you know, who thinks that the whole narrative has overstated the risk of China? Actually, the slowdown is not that much, but I think the implications are different. The energy thing, your parameters, if the way you use the parameters and the labor market ones change dramatically the framing of the question. Just to give you one example, what even large firms versus small firms, there is this issue of actually, is it 
energy efficiency that's creating it or the other it's the most of the evidence most of the studies show it's only the firms which have the resources then go into it and so that's why when they're expanding they do it so so the framing of the issue becomes totally different so i just want to maybe sure. today focus on the first one for dhruv how is this i'm i'm having spent more than 30 years and associated with 40 how is this report different than what an imf would produce I'm very glad that you mentioned the K-shaped recovery because the, you know, I think I was stunned that there was no mention of it. It's, there's more mention of it in the US, there's more mention of it in China and most developing countries. But then on the technical side also, I mean, in terms of investment drivers, et cetera, et cetera, it goes in. Amrita and Tedu both mentioned what are the drivers of the investment, you know, that they demand. It's not at all clear. Just another one. A key factor you talk about services, having spent many years on the, in the sort of as in NASCOM, the fact is that the the whole service revolution thing gets totally changed and distorted in terms of framing policy, unless you disaggregate between modern and traditional services, and within that between different categories. Let me just talk about. Okay. So you can't talk about services; it makes no sense. Okay. You have to disaggregate them. Okay. Francisca, you wanted to address. Yeah. Other questions as well. Yeah, uh, just very briefly on the on the productivity and the exchange rate. Uh, so we'll come back, but our preliminary results already show that India has actually grown. At least labor productivity has been very strong, and that's just arithmetic because of the high growth rate and weak employment growth. <laughs> so in in some sense, there is a success story here, but we'll come back with details um, on your exchange rate misalignment. Um, it's, it's, it's a very important issue. It's a very important issue, especially for countries that are managing the exchange rates. For other countries, the policy implication is very difficult because it really goes back to fiscal. You know, that if, if your exchange rate is misaligned, but your exchange rate is floating, then it's, it's all about fiscal policy, essentially. So that, hence the, the, the emphasis in all our work on fiscal policy. We, so in a, some sense, we are working on it. <laughs> We're just not formalizing it in this framework. But you have to be careful with the caveat your remarks not to say whether the company is co-valued or not. I, you're the better judge. I haven't looked into it. The World Bank should have a view on that. The entire external sector depends on it. It's <laughs> I want to get back also to the aviation question. That's a topic that keeps coming up in the context of the energy transition. Because the aviation sector struggles to become more energy efficient. But that's the beauty of these market-based regulations. They, they, they set a price on energy or pollution, in this case, pollution of different types, pollution uh, PM 2.5 or pollution, greenhouse gas pollution. And it's it's... In some sense, it encourages some firms that can easily cut their pollution and then sell the permits in some form or other to aviation to the aviation industry that cannot easily cut the, the, the permits. But that's why it's so important to see how policy steers the energy transition. It's, it really needs to be market-based by having prices on things, prices on pollution. It could be cap and trade regimes. Like I think Gujarat is trying one of these. It could be sub, uh, subsidy reform. It could be uh, it could be carbon taxes in other countries. I think even China is, is putting in place some carbon tax. Chile has done it. It's not just an advanced economy thing. So even emerging markets can put in place carbon taxes and regimes that work. But you're right. It's a critical then to to allow for things like the uh, aviation industry. It's very important that. Whatever regulations put in place is market-based. I do want to come back to the questions on uh, the China scenario. The baseline is a slowdown, a gentle slowdown. A gentle slowdown to 4.4, 4.3% over the next couple of years. It's, a, it's gentle, but it's below potential growth for China, what we think is potential growth. The scenario is a steep slowdown. So that's how we split it. It's a very steep slowdown, actually. Uh, that's the, that's the yeah, for yeah, the that, for the risk, that's the one, that's, exactly. That's a very steep slowdown, but it, it's a tail risk. It's a very steep slowdown that could then have global implications. Your question on the energy efficiency, so uh, yes, in part, that could be because of the type of firms, but we do control for the most obvious things. 
uh, we do, it's, it's a result of a regression where we control for all the firm characteristics that we have data on. So size, for example, what you mentioned is a control. So it's even controlling for size. The, the ones who have cut energy intensity most are the ones who've created more employment. But you're right, there might be residual factors that we can't control for. And for that, the income and structure and the market. Could be, yeah. Okay, uh, cool. So, um, they were very easy questions to answer. Uh, so, so I'm glad uh, Francesca took some uh, time uh, to answer. Let me, um, uh, let me try and uh, uh, give you an answer um, uh, on infrastructure, uh, sorry, uh, on investment first. Um, what are drivers there? Um, so in terms of disaggregated uh, drivers, real estate, uh, real estate sector, the construction sector, and uh, public investment. Um, these are just shorter term drivers of growth. In the long term, what we see as drivers of growth um, is improved financial intermediation, uh, improved availability of credit, and also the government's own manufacturing push. And so, of course, we won't necessarily see these right now, okay? But this is over a period of time. India's share uh, investment as a share of GDP has actually been increasing. And yes, there probably will be an upper limit to it, maybe 35% or so, but it has increased. And India's uh, growth, uh, investment growth has actually is growing faster than its long-term trend. Yes, in our projections, it's coming down uh, as a trajectory, but it is going much faster than it has over a longer period of time. So this might have this might not show up uh, immediately. Uh, as I said, you can differentiate between two sets uh, in, intertemporarily. Um, uh, we're doing some work on uh, uh, on the services side. Your point about services is uh, well noted. There is traditional market services and modern market services, and the story there is is different. And we're hoping next time round we might actually be able to delve a little bit more into that. Um, and 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 if I if I may uh, indulge uh, 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 and 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 uh, uh, sidestep how is how are we different from the IMF? Um, I mean, look, <laughs> we produce our analysis. Uh, we have slightly different um, forecasts every now and then, but uh, and 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 uh, you know we may not always agree on 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 certain things uh, as well. Uh, and so, how is it different from the IMF? Um, I think they'll be releasing their uh, uh, World Economic Outlook uh, next week, uh, so we'll find out then. My question was about numbers. Yes. Framing of the things. Sure. Is it traditionally a different thing between bank and bond? Yeah. Okay. But the side you would like to ask any question, please. One thing I found missing over the relation with the uh, Pakistan gets all its cotton from here. But the cotton has to leave Bombay, get out on the sea. Then they have to pay through Dubai. Why on earth can't we just exchange? Similarly, Bangladesh. Bangladesh is really lives on exports. It's a very good exporting country. But it has one port, Chittagong. Uh, the others are very small and can't get take big ships. Now, there was a time when we thought of letting them use Vishakhapatnam, but hardly anything comes through Vishakhapatnam now. So why don't we give them port facilities? Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka is bankrupt. This, and prices there have fallen to a half. Now, when I last went there, the prices there were one third of what they were here. In other words, Today, there may be one sixth. And yet, hardly any Indians are going there as tourists. Why on earth not? And why don't we promote it? So, there are all sorts of opportunities within a thousand miles of us, which we don't even look at. Okay, I think a uh, quick answer from either Dhruv or Jessica. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You're right. Huh? This region really stands out among other emerging markets and developing economy regions. How little interconnectedness there is and how high the, the uh, transport costs are, the, the trade costs. So on average in this region, South Asia, average trade costs are the equivalent of 140% tariff. Whereas in other countries, uh, trade costs, not just tariffs, not their, their logistics, etc. In other countries, on the order of 120%. This region is one of the ones with the, it's the second highest 
It has the second highest trade cost among all emerging market and developing regions. And it also has something about this region that, <laughs> that leads to this uh, restrictiveness. Uh, if you look at, you talked about trade, but look at capital flows, same story. The capital controls on inflows and outflows are above the emerging market and developing economy average. This region is just very closed. Okay, I think uh, we have come to the end of this excellent discussion. Uh, now my request to Auguste is to uh, make his closing remarks and, uh, and propose a vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, AK. Um, I actually wanted to start with a vote of thanks so that if between now and when I finish, some of you leave, at least I'll have a chance to <laughs> share my vote of thanks with you. And my own remarks are really unimportant at this point. Uh, I really would like to, uh, to, to thank uh, Lavish for your kind opening remark and also your kind partnership with us to, to do this uh, uh, here at uh, um, CSEP. And I actually think that this is something we should do more of. I think uh, uh, every now and again, it's good to come out here and, and, and sh uh, use your platform to share some of our findings and our struggles too, as you can see, you know, we don't have all the answers, but uh, we like to uh, share with uh, a broader audience what we're working on and how we can benefit from input. Thank you also, uh, AKB, uh, here, that's the, the best way of referring to you for your excellent uh, chairmanship of, of the session. Um, uh, Renu and Amrita, thanks so much for your, your comment and for your provocative comments, and uh, and especially sharing with us first where we perhaps uh, need to be uh, uh, more careful with our assumptions, and also uh, 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 sharing with us what we can work on together and what you're working on coming up. So we'll now uh, uh, make sure that we all uh, uh, look at your work on environmental uh, economics in the case of uh, Amrita, and and make sure that we. We all retrain ourselves uh, as, um, actually, reskill ourselves as environmental economists. Uh, thanks also to my uh, colleagues, Francesca and Andrew, for your excellent presentation. It was always, you know, I've heard these uh, presentations several times, but I always learn something new whenever I hear it again. Uh, and again, thanks for uh, for the audience and and for for your patience and for being um, for being here. Uh, to CSEP uh, colleagues. Uh, um, you know, in addition to to uh, to Lavish, thank you very much for for hosting us, and we look forward to working with you again. Um, my own remarks would be uh, a bit uh, brief uh, because I know we are really out of time. You know, I would like to focus on you know what I noted as as risks um, because I you know I think the first one of the first things I heard is that you know we may sound too optimistic, so. I think we don't emphasize risks enough. You know, our forecasts are, uh, are good because the region is doing well, India is doing well in the very difficult global environment. But yes, indeed, there are risks. And what are, one risk you heard us mention, uh, and especially in Francesca's presentation, is the risk of high debt. You know, if you're going to continue growing, uh, you will need financing, especially if you're a developing country. And if your debt level is already high in an environment where interest rates are also high, it may pose a challenge uh, going forward, even if you have the best intention to uh, consolidate fiscally and create more space on the public sector side. It's still very challenging. So we are aware of those risks. Uh, I just wanted to, 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 to mention that. And there are virtually no country in the South Asia region that has a very comfortable space uh, to finance more growth, a lot more growth, uh, without putting more pressure either on the, on the fiscal deficit or on debt or, or interest rate or risk of crowding out the private sector. Um, the second risk that we, we, we talked about, which we, made, we, we should talk about more, is the risk of the green transition. It is risky. It is something that we all need to do. The world needs to shift toward a greener production system, but it is risky for various reasons. Some people will be left behind. Some people will be uh, the losers. Uh, there are cost issues. Uh, there are regulatory issues. Uh, there are many challenges. But those challenges should not encourage us from walking away uh, from the green transition. We need to embrace it and work harder and, and, 
and incorporate the risk in policy making so that they can be reduced. The third risk I noted is a risk we don't talk a lot about uh, at the bank, which is the risk of optimism bias. Uh, you know, some of you told us, you know, we are too optimistic about fiscal consolidation, we're too optimistic about assumptions on consumption uh, picking up, uh, uh, or we're too optimistic about uh, private investment picking up, we're optimistic about, uh, you know, uh, even the financial sector. Um, yes, uh, there is that risk uh, of optimism bias, but the, the good thing is that we, re we revise our forecast regularly. So whenever we see that we're becoming too optimistic, we revise them. And this time we maintained our forecast in the case of India to 6.3 because we think we got it right. And in fact, some other forecasters also revised their forecast to come closer to ours. Uh, so we think we are in the right place in terms of optimism bias. But if we think we going forward based on new data, we can we can uh, uh, correct our forecast. Uh, the fourth and largest risk uh, is, of course, the global uh, challenges. The global environment is a very risky place to to be today. And um, uh, Larry Summer talked a lot about it. In fact, his talk, the talk he gave here a few weeks ago. Uh, was called, the title was uh, The World is on Fire. Uh, it is a very difficult uh, global environment and uh, that I won't belabor that risk, but I wanted to also say that there are op opportunities um, to, to global challenges. The G20 told us that in fact if we come together, together as a global community, we can fix some of these challenges. You know, maybe geopolitical tensions are very difficult, but they can be, they can be fixed, right? Um, some of the uh, uh, global issues, we see if there's more coordination among central banks, maybe we can even work on the high interest rate environment and, uh, and, and you know, create dynamism for growth in some part of the world where growth is possible, but we haven't, you know, banked much on it. I would bank a lot on growth in uh, emerging market economies. Um, you know, we, you know, there are in, in Latin America, in Africa, there are pockets of growth that we can bank on. And those could become markets uh, for countries that want to grow. They could become export markets for India, for, for, for even uh, Europe and, 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 and the U.S. So I think as a global community, we need to bank more on growth for others, not just focusing on growth for us, because growth for others is also good for our own growth uh, as individual countries. Um, the... You know, there was a question on this six to eight. Um, it's a tough one, um, uh, and we can have a, a whole other session on, on it. Uh, I will, you know, it reminds me of a book that is called From Good to Great. Uh, you know, I don't know whether, whether you're familiar with that, with that book. So for India, six is good, actually. You know, in the world, in the world in which we are today, growing at 6% is good. You're growing at potential. Your potential is not that low. Um, it's one of the highest growth rate, uh, you know, among large economies, at least. Last year, India's 6.2% was the second highest growth rate among 7.2. 7, 7 yes, last year's India's 7.2% growth rate was the second highest growth rate among G20 countries. It was twice the average for emerging market economies. So, you know, India is doing pretty well. It's good. Uh, but India needs to be great, right? And... Um, because India wants to become a developed country and therefore that requires 8%. So the 6 to 8 to me is like going from, the 6 to 8 is like from going from good to great. And what will it take to get to great? It takes exceptional effort. That's what the book tells us actually. You can't just rest on your laurels. You can't just do business as usual. You have to be very adept and alert at seizing opportunities and building on your strengths. Um, and actually, you have to be able to uh, use the market to come with you, to use the global market in the case of India. So a few things very quickly. Um, um, working with uh, the world, the rest of the world, to create a better environment is something that if I were India, I would focus on. And India has shown through the G20 presidency that India ha can do that. So work with the world to create this environment that we all want, to create a benign global environment. Second, work on domestic factors, work on capital. You know, capital is, is, is a big factor for growth, uh, but not just public investment. Private investment is also very important. 
So use public investment to crowd in private investment and use reforms to facilitate private investment and make private investment uh, come in very quickly. You know, we can't wait for too long because uh, the more you grow, grow at 6% for a few years, the more you will need to grow at more than 8% for the remaining years. So let's, don't delay the 8% growth rate too much. You know, get to it quickly um, so that by 2047, you know, you reach the, 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 the final uh, goal of becoming a high-income country uh, with less need to grow at 10% in future years. Um, you also need to work on human capital. Uh, human capital is also an important factor in creating growth. And, and to, for, for us, and there was a question raised earlier on that, perhaps this is the lowest hanging fruit for India. Um, you know, India has a large population. It's a very good natural endowment. And India has a well-educated population, thanks to investment in education and health uh, in the past. So now is the time to use it. Male labor force participation is not as high as in the rest of the world. It's around 60%. In the rest of the world, you can see 70, 80% easily. So I'll talk about women, uh, female labor force participation in, in a moment. But even on the male side, there is a need to get more people to work. Then on the female side, it is India is far be, behind other countries. Uh, India's female labor force participation is 25%. We estimate that if India were to increase that female labor force participation to just 50%, which is the average for India's income group, that alone will add one percentage point to GDP growth. And if India were to increase female labor force participation to match male labor force participation, let's say the new 70%, that could add another one percent to GDP growth. So you get your eight percent just by working on the human capital side and by leveraging the natural endowment and the investment that has been made already in education and health. So it is possible, coming back to Larry, Larry Summers' point, it is absolutely possible, but it cannot be taken for granted. It has to take, it, it will take work. And the final aspect of what it will take on the production side is productivity. We talked about TFP. TFP is actually, actually respectable in India, but it can be higher. It, can, it could potentially reach 3.5%. Uh, you know, pretty easily by doing what? By working on uh, the first institutions that interact with the producers. So making things agile, making it easier to do business and to produce and to sell and to import and to export, that will increase productivity pretty quickly. Um, you know, work on infrastructure that connect markets to production, production centers. Work, work on logistics. Use some of the public investment to facilitate logistics to reduce cost of, uh, you know, you know fi frictional cost, basically, in, in, in how you move things, goods, and people around. Uh, so I'll stop here, but, but the point is, it is possible to go, to go from good to great, but it will take effort. With that, let me thank uh, everybody again, and it's really a pleasure. I, I hope we'll have a chance to do this again. And thanks to the panel. <laughs>